All right, this passage is beginning to talk all about faith, what it is, what it pursues, what you can expect from it, and some really great examples of faith. It's probably going to take us a couple days, so start with me today, and uh, it's going to be fun. Hey, welcome to Bible Time, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. This is Hebrews chapter 10. We're starting in verse 32. Craig here. So glad that you're with me. Hey, if you want to stay up to date on these videos, make sure you hit subscribe. And I think there's a little bell that you can hit and it'll let you know every time that a video comes out. Although, it basically comes out at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time every day. That is the plan. That is the goal, Lord willing. I will keep doing that with the end goal, just so you know, of you simply growing in your relationship with God and your obedience to Him. This is not about being religious. It's not about checking a box on our to-do sheet. It's about seeking God, being fed by his word, and spending time in prayer, listening to his Holy Spirit. So I hope that you're doing that, getting that out of these, and um, that I just wanna make sure that that goal is always forefront. I'm not trying to build a name for myself. I'm trying to lift up the name of Jesus and help Jesus followers be healthy. So to that end, we're jumping into a fun section that has begun to be a little challenging, but challenge is part of our health as well as much as encouragement is and so we're, we're starting at verse 32 but just remember that what has taken place in this last section is a pretty severe um not just a warning but like a declaration of what is actually happening if we continue sinning deliberately if we continue choosing to sin intentional sin we trample underfoot the son of god we profane the blood of the covenant, and we outrage the spirit. I would assume none of those three things are things that you want to do, and none of them are things that I want to do. So this is kind of the seriousness of the section we're jumping into. Verse 32 it continues. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. So he's, he's obviously talking to a specific group of people, a specific group of Hebrew people right now. Um, and just like many of the books in the Bible, they were written to a specific person or group of people for a specific reason, but uh, for all of the ages, for all of the peoples of the earth, we can learn from the stories, uh, learn from and, and grab onto and adhere to the principles of God. Um, and so, Anyway, that's what's going on here. He's talking to some specific people, but we have to ask ourselves the question, okay, what did they go through? What was God's intention? What's described in the scripture? And how does this apply to my life now? So, after you were enlightened, that is, after you had come to know of who Jesus is, come to believe in his reality and what he did, then you endured hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. So there was a lot of persecution and sometimes public affliction, public uh, persecution, affliction, you know, possibly beating, torturing, making, being made fun of, even martyrdom, that is being killed for your faith. So uh, a lot of persecution, a lot of struggle for these guys. So let's see what happens. For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding and an abiding one. Wow. Joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Plundering meaning stealing or, you know, basically somebody coming into your house or, you know, against your stuff and just taking it all. So I don't know exactly what these guys went through uh, and what their attitude was, but according to the author, he believes that they accepted it joyfully. And there's a reason why, since they knew that they had a better possess uh, possession and abiding one. Maybe speaking about the kingdom of heaven just the gifts that God gives, I don't know. 
I don't know what he's specifically talking about, a better possession and abiding one, but I do know that generally speaking, we we can and should believe that any possession we have on this life, in this life, um, it pales in comparison to the possession that we have in Jesus. His kingdom, the benefits that go along with following him, not just in the afterlife, but in this life. I mean, yeah, it's still super weird that they joyfully accepted it. I don't know if, if they knew that whatever this persecution was, was a direct result of their faith, in which case, um, you know, they're just receiving the persecution for the sake of the faith. I don't know. Either way, it's uh, always a challenge to read passages like this and to remember that most of us, we don't face anything near persecution, really anything that can be considered real persecution. And so, to ask ourselves, you know, first of all, to just thank God for the life that we get to live. Number two, to ask ourselves if and when that time comes, how will we, re how will we respond? Will we continue to be of the utmost character, of the utmost faith, of the utmost love and joy in Jesus, even if we're facing hard times like that? So, and then here's the encouragement. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward for you have been for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God you may receive what is promised for yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay but my righteous one shall live by faith this is going to be a theme that we're going to see uh, basically the whole next chapter is about faith and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. We are not of those people who do what? Shrink back, resulting in destruction. Rather, we are of those who have faith and do what? Preserve their souls. Hmm. And so let's see what he has to say about faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Okay, this section is all about faith. It's assurance of things hoped for. Assurance. Confidence. Confidence in what is hoped for. Okay, so you're hoping, you have confidence, you have assurance, you know, you know that something that is just hoped for is going to happen. And you have a conviction of things that are not seen. Okay, so this is the one of the main Bible definitions for faith that people reference because it is one that is basically clearly written out. But many, many places all over the New Testament, especially it talks about faith and Jesus um, comes proclaiming faith and faith in him. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace we've been saved through faith and this not of yourselves is a gift of God, not by works so that nobody, nobody can boast. Yeah, so here we go. Let's continue to see what it says about faith. For by it, faith, 
the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen may not so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The kind of Bible term for how God created uh, ex nihilo Latin for out of nothing. It's the, bi the biblical belief and the theological stance is that God created out of nothing. He spoke things into being that were not, and he built them out of nothing. He didn't use other materials to build. He built out of nothing. Okay, so we're going to continue on in the section that's beginning to speak about all of the great people of faith throughout the Old Testament. So, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. Okay, so we got Abel, an acceptable sacrifice, and he was commended as righteous. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Okay, so we got character number two, Enoch. And... He pleased God. By faith. And here comes that, that other really important declaration in Hebrews 11. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God, whoever being anybody that wants to, he must, number one, actually I'll put that right here. He must, number one, believe that God exists, and number two, that he rewards those who seek him. Believe that God exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. This is an interesting passage for me because I have struggled over the years with this idea of what some call the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel, the, the sentiment that basically preaches, if you do right for God, you will be blessed with material things or health and money, and prosperity, and all of these things that uh, are in many, many cases material, physical of this world and sometimes really worldly. Not all the time, but sometimes. And yet, that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant against that kind of preaching because I've, it's been abused by many people. Many people have been hurt by this idea. And, you know, it's just, it's just becomes all about money and gain stuff from God, using God like a supernatural Santa Claus. And so I've kind of been hesitant uh, towards that type of belief and, and kind of uh, I know a lot of people are um, and then at the same time this passage challenges my hesitancy to a degree because we all know that faith is important it is only by faith that we are saved um, it, is, it is by grace through faith like we acquire that salvation through faith not by our works not by our legalism not by our religion but through genuine faith in our heart and, and so it's an extremely important topic. It's, it's the primary thing that we need to unite us in restorative relationship with God. And so this is talking about faith. And the, the scriptural author says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And then there's basically a little definition of what you need to have faith in specifically. Whoever would draw near to God, uh, you know, again, uh, with the assumption that that happens through faith. We already know that that can only happen through faith. You can only draw near to God through faith. So, so he's still talking about faith. Whoever would draw near to God 
must do two things or must have faith for two things. Number one, believe that he's real, <laughs> that he exists. Okay, check. Yeah, I mean, if you don't believe that he, you know, you're not going to draw near to him if you don't be actually believe that he's there. And number two, that he rewards those who seek him. One version says who diligently seek him. And so what does this mean to be rewarded? Does it mean simply that he gives uh, salvation and that's the reward and that's more than enough? For sure it is. Does it mean that he gives salvation and, and you get to go to heaven when you die, but then and now you, you get to receive his spirit, his, his Holy Spirit and his presence living in you? Um, yeah, that is the reward and that's worth it also just by itself. Um, but but it doesn't say that it's not more. Like there surely that there are blessings that come with honoring God in this life. Whether it means you're gonna make a million dollars or always be healthy or get that perfect husband or wife that you want or that perfect house or car or whatever. No, it's not saying that either, for sure. But it is saying that you ha that you need to believe that he rewards those that seek him. And so maybe there's a middle ground there of like, you know, not, you know, believing for that one specific thing, even though it's okay to believe for specific things, but that doesn't mean that God owes us that car or that job or whatever, but just a general belief that man, I would, whatever God does, whether I see it coming or I don't, whether it was the thing that I wanted or the thing that I didn't want, but he knew that I needed, I know that he exists. And that in, in his way, in his timing, for his purposes, according to his will, he's going to reward me for seeking him. And so I've been stretched. I think it is important that we believe that because it commands us to. It says that it's, it's necessary. It's impossible to please him without believing those things. And so I want to please him. I want to trust his word. And I thank him for whatever reward he chooses to bestow upon me. And even if we go through suffering, as many of the disciples and many believers throughout time have, um, to believe that there is even reward in that. Probably spiritual reward. Reward in knowing in your heart that you're doing the right thing, standing up for Jesus. But yeah, we got to believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. So I don't know what your takeaways are today. Um, obviously, anytime we read the Bible, we want to see, well, how can this apply to my life? And um, so I'd encourage you to spend some time praying about that. As for me, this passage is challenging and just simply in my faith life to, to believe that he's real, he's there, and that he wants to reward us as we seek him. So that's what I got for today. We will pick up in chapter 11, verse 7 tomorrow. We'll see you then.